Hey everybody, welcome back to the best series on YouTube, where I go over five plus of the scariest levels inside of the entire back rooms in one single video. Today I'm actually gonna go over six of these levels, so you get a little bonus. If you do enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like for more of these long form content styles. And if you do not enjoy, I sincerely hope your pillow is warm when you go to bed tonight. Anyways, without further ado, let's get into the video, shall we? Across wanderers inside of the back rooms, Barnaby's Fun Emporium is probably one of the most horrific and strange levels that we found as of this date. The level resembles an abandoned early 80s era children's party restaurant. The history of the restaurant itself is not fully known or understood, but there's notes and there's marketing from around it that are pointed to a few facts. We know for sure that the company that owned this restaurant went bankrupt in the year 1990, and that the restaurant's name is Barnaby's Bun Fun Emporium, and Barnaby seemed to close in 1989. The level's existence has brought forth several theories about the backrooms and how it relates to real life and the concepts of heaven and hell. There are several just strange demonic items and images that have been found in this level, as well as some very dark concepts and themes, too. There's been several items of interest taken from this level to be examined by Meg, and those are Barnaby party decorations, expired ingredients, expired soda, and party-themed merchandise like balloons and confetti, and then finally, frozen pizzas. All of these items have been taken by Meg employees to look further into and to try to examine and deduce how they got there. Now, if you noticed, all of these items are pretty much what you would expect to find in an old arcade diner from the late 80s. It's been heavily noted that you should never, under any circumstance, eat anything on this level. No matter how good it looks, no matter how fresh it looks, do not eat anything here. The level is not fully explored, but as of right now, we just have this rudimentary description. There's a lowly lit, dark restaurant area with booths and tables and chairs. An empty, staticky aura resides over the entire level. If you ever went to Chuck E. Cheese as a kid, it kind of looks like that. The level feels as if it's stuck outside of time, and nothing has changed since 1989 when it closed. It feels like it's been abandoned though, but nothing's changed. There are remnants of a party that's been held here at one point, in the form of strange decorations, streamers, happy birthday balloons, and all that stuff being hung up. It feels like there was something happening, and then everybody left all at once. And the entire area feels so strange and eerie to be inside of. Only one entity has been documented to exist within the level's confines, and it's been described as a large Leporidae-like figure, which is the company's mascot, Barnaby. Now, a Laporte is a type of rabbit, so you can kind of imagine an uncanny rabbit animatronic mascot thing. That's what Barnaby looks like. Now, from this description, we also get the little tidbit that the logo for Barnaby's Fun Emporium has this rabbit's face in it. That's pretty much all the information we know about the business itself. We know that it has a bunny face on it, and we know that it's named Barnaby's Bun Fun Emporium. Who knows if that means something, but it's cool nonetheless. The behaviors of Barnaby and its aura have been described as the following. Barnaby rarely shows itself to visitors, and when or if it does, it'll slowly appear from the darker corners of the restaurant with an unbreaking and piercing gaze. It's pretty much just staring holes through you and if anybody else is there. Barnaby almost never speaks or vocalizes, and any audio that comes out of its suit is very staticky and unintelligible gibberish. It just kind of sounds like a robot talking, but a broken one. Its attitude and treatment of wanderers that visit the level will change depending on who's there. Sometimes Barnaby's passive, and they don't even acknowledge that you're there, but other people will get attacked instantly by Barnaby without hesitation and these attacks are very ruthless. Barnaby will bite and claw and scratch and pretty much tear its victims from limb from limb, and what Barnaby does with these victims afterwards is unknown. We don't know if it consumes them or stores them somewhere. We have no idea. There have been numerous attempts and investigation to find the bodies of missing people here. However, none have succeeded. Barnaby is incapable of leaving the Levels restaurant or escaping the level at all. 
even though it's displayed a high level of intelligence and it seems to be fully aware of its surroundings, Barnaby's existence is still unknown. It can't tell us why it's there and we also don't know why it can't leave. But what I just explained to you is literally all we know. It's a strange, rabbit-like, mascot, animatronic thing that may or may not attack you if you come here. Now, you cannot harm Barnaby, and any use of weapons that has been used in the past has not worked at all. To be frank, it's actually done worse for you, because then Barnaby will get mad. And this just makes the creature that more dangerous. As if it could have gotten scarier than a giant animatronic bunny. There are no bases here, of course. I doubt Barnaby would enjoy or appreciate that. And if you come to the Fun Emporium, the only known entrance is from level 4, the office building. Now, you might run across an elevator with the Barnaby Bun Fun Emporium logo on it, and if you do in level 4, you open it up, and you'll enter inside here from a janitor's closet. Now, exiting the level is as simple as getting back in that elevator that you used to enter. The only problem is, occasionally the entrance to this elevator will not open. It'll just be stuck closed, and it's been known to change itself into that janitor's closet for extended periods of time before turning back to the elevator. So you better hope that when you're trying to leave, Barnaby isn't fed up with you and chasing you around because you don't have time to wait for the elevator then. But this exit is not guaranteed to appear instantly. Barnaby's Fun Emporium is not very well understood. And even the information I just told you took forever for Meg to catalog and describe. As of right now, it's a very, very dangerous thing to get sent here since your safety cannot be guaranteed because, you know, Barnaby has his own mind. it has been kidnapping people for years. Theories on this level range from it being a forgotten real-world diner from the front rooms from the 1980s, and it somehow ended up here, to it being a diner from another dimension from the multiverse, to other things, like Barnaby being the creator of the level, and it kind of functions as a trap for Barnaby to consume people as their prey. Who knows, whatever it may be, it's a very dangerous place, and it should not be trifled with under any circumstance at all. You've been warned by me, you've been warned by Meg, don't go. It's, it's that simple, man. Me personally, I could probably, you know, take him in a fight, but that's just because I'm me. You're not me. Backroom's level, the tree's scream, is underneath the anomalous section of levels in the fandom. So we're really not sure where the level falls or what number it'll have or like where it's located physically, but all that we do know is what I'm about to go over. The level has been given a class 5 difficulty and is, of course, very unsafe and unsecure, and there are very few documented entities. None of them are regular, but there's still some. I'll get into it later. The level itself is split up into four known parts. Those are the woods, the sirens, the screaming scenery, and the camera cloud forest. And I'll get into all those in a second, but first, the level's basic appearance will start like this. You'll wake up on the level, and you'll notice that all around you there is a dark, never-ending forest with very little light. No matter where you go on this level, there's going to be a bunch of trees surrounding and engulfing you. The trees themselves are very tall, very wide, and they just give off very bad energy. You feel like you're in an ocean, but there's no actual water waves, it's just trees. The level is extremely loud, like deafeningly loud. It'll make you lose your hearing. And there's many, many different types of sounds coming from different parts of the level. You could hear a siren sound, or a loud screech, or screams, or moans, or wails, or cries in pain. Literally anything like that, any loud, crass noise, you're going to hear while you're on this level. I'll get into where those sounds are coming from in a second, but after you walk around the level for an extended amount of time and kind of just make your way through that first forest, you'll begin to notice something about the trees in the forest. There seems to be sirens shoved into the bark at random places, and those noises that I just talked about are coming from those sirens. The longer you're here, the louder and louder they're going to get, and after approximately 17 minutes of you being here, the screaming and the siren sounds will become unbearably loud. It's at this point where the sounds get to an estimated 130 decibels, which if you don't know, that's loud, that's really loud. You'll begin to lose your mind, you'll begin to lose your hearing, and everything will become glitchy and start to warp. It is literally so loud that the physical air that you're walking through will feel like it's a real thing you can touch. That's how loud the sound waves are, you can almost touch them. At this point, everything that you can see will begin to change. The trees themselves will seem to warp 
and manifest themselves into radio towers and siren towers, and the ground underneath you will begin to warp into a pathway. Everything at this point is so loud that you've essentially lost the ability to hear, and now everything just looks different. This will transition us into the next part of this level, which is the siren site. After the trees warp fully into sirens, you begin to enter this area. The sirens here produce all forms of sounds at all forms of wavelengths. You'll get things like air horns or tornado sirens or emergency alerts or legitimately any kind of siren you can think of inside of this area. And the noises the sirens produce are constant. There's no like break in between. They're always blaring. The towers themselves are similar to how the trees were because they're very tall, very wide, and they just go up in the sky for an indefinite amount of time. The landscape where the sirens appear is a little bit more flat and rocky than the woods were. The woods were kind of hilly, but these towers just give off these very dark and foreboding vibes as you look up towards them. Of course, they're also constantly blaring loud noises. That doesn't help either, but everything here is just terrifying looking. The towers are also known to collapse and fall down at random times, so unless you want to get you know, squished like a bug, I would recommend watching out. Walking through the siren sites, you could randomly be teleported to the next part of the level, the screaming scenery. Now this is the part of the level that takes place in a vast cornfield and a flower field. It's kind of like corn and flour mixed together. As far as the eye can see, just a big corn crop field. The plants here are so thick that it'll take a lot of physical force to push your way through them and to continue wandering, and this is actually the only part of the level with physical dangers that might hurt you. The rest of the place tends to have the auditory dangers, but the danger here is in the form of a mysterious entity that runs through the cornfield and lives inside of it. It's unknown what the entity is or what it looks like, but it's been nicknamed the Banshee. And of course, if you know what a banshee does, banshees scream very, very loudly. And in this field, you'll know the banshee's near when you hear it gurgling and screaming. It's been known to chase after people who are lost inside the corn, and it's been known to eat them. So if you escape that entity, you're one of the lucky ones. And in order to move on to the next part of the level, you do have to escape it. And by escaping it, you'll end up in the original forest of the beginning of the level, and that's when the cycle will start over and over again forest, to the siren site, to the screaming scenery, and over and over and over and over and over. It's like an eternal hell. If you're lucky, you'll actually find your way into the camera cloud forest, which is the next part of the level, and this is actually the quietest part of the level by far. There's no abrupt sounds, there's no loud sirens, no screaming, and your ears can finally take a break. A well-deserved break, that is. The Camera Cloud Forest is a very large and expansive spruce forest with a cool and misty aura and ambience. There's a thick mist that runs everywhere, and everything here seems very serene. The only thing that seems to be out of place in this specific forest is the cameras that are placed in the sides of the trees. The cameras seem to be watching you and kind of tracking your movements, but nothing deadly has happened with the cameras yet, so I guess it's kind of okay to search around. Walking through this forest, you might find things like chairs and desks and seats and pencils and printers and other types of office furniture scattered around. It's completely unknown why they're here, but they are. One wanderer actually claimed to find a small shack in these woods with a monitor inside of it that showed all the cameras that were in the forest. They could see whatever's happening. Now, why this monitor exists and the shack exists, who watches the monitor, or if it's actually connected to any other part of the level, it's unknown. Does some powerful entity control the level? Is there a human here? Or is it like just a mishmash of random environments that just so happen to be loud and full of sirens? I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments below. There are no colonies, of course, since you can't have a bunch of people losing their hearing, because that wouldn't work. And to enter, you can only be in a forest-themed level, walk too deep into those forests, and you can get sent here. Or, if you're a screamer, you can scream loudly in any hall, on any level, for a chance to be sent here as well. To exit, you need to be in the cornfield, walk deep enough into it, until you kind of find a part of level 10's field, which is just tall wheat. And then once you find that, walk into it and you'll be on level 10. It's pretty simple. This level is literally one of the worst ones you can get sent to in my eyes, mainly for the, obviously, the auditory dangers. I don't want to get my eardrums bursted, but that is just a terrible place. Imagine, you know, being trapped like a prison in this forest, in these fields, and just hearing these sirens blaring constantly for days and days until you go crazy. 
No one knows anything about this level's effects or its layout or why it behaves the way it does. So for now, honestly, just don't go exploring it. You should be okay if you don't do that. So to begin, I want to go over a backrooms level square root two. So if you aren't aware or you haven't heard of square roots, it's a mathematical term where a number under the square root symbol is divisible by two of the same numbers. For example, the square root of 16 is four because four times four is 16. The square root of four is two because two times two is four. And the square root of 25 is five because five times five is 25. So on and so forth. You get what it is. Math lessons with Brugley. Leave a like. So this level's name is Square Root 2, which would mean it's actually Backrooms level 1.414213562237. That's a mouthful, but that is a weird name. The level, of course, is an enigmatic level, and it's classified as a class Sigma like Sigma Brugli, and it's classified that because of its unreliable documentations and its non-Euclidean space and weird creature thing. This one's just plain strange. I'm, not, I'm gonna be honest with you here. This is one of the only levels that's actually classified as Class Sigma, so I think you, you kind of see how weird it's gonna be. The level takes the appearance of a constant state of fluctuation in a grid plane. There are weird blue fibers and geometric void shapes and everything like that constantly flying around. The size of the level is really unknown because of the constant shifting and because it's pretty dangerous to even try to walk here since the integers of the level move around 24 seven. There are blue lines and grids that shoot through the sky constantly and you can see them and that they're real, but they can't hurt you because they pass through all matter. So if you're walking around, the blue lines can just cut right through you. The entire space of the level is non-Euclidean, of course, and it's kind of a grid plane that you can get trapped into. Think of a coordinate plane that you've seen from like the retro stuff. That's what this place looks like. It seems to be that this level is controlled by a creature or entity or something that's kind of mathematical because there's been reports of an entity in the level that are described as, quote, the eternal nature of numbers and that this entity is also, quote, lonely in their world. An entire Googleplex could pass by without any external contact, end quote. So it sounds like this entity is lonely and it's weird mathematic void type thing. Kind of sad. Leave a like for it. There are no bases or communities here since it's just literally an empty grid plane with blue strings and stuff. And to enter, you have to find an imaginary number on level 81 to get sent here. To be honest, I have no clue how you do that. Don't come asking me, but that's the only way to get here. To exit, you have to find a randomly appearing door in this grid plane and open it up and you'll be sent out. Obviously, this level was a weird one, but I think it was pretty cool. I love the mathematical strangeness of it all. It's just very mind bending. If you think about it, a coordinate void with weird geometry and all this weird stuff thrown through the air. I don't know how to explain it better than that. Hope you liked it. Level Help is next, and this is also a very strange name for a very strange level. It starts with this notice. Quote, the following document is solely based off of a single source of information, that being a corrupted file discovered in the backup drive of the Meg database. It was successfully restored, and whatever viable information that could be gleaned from it is presented herein. Additionally, for the purpose of posterity, an unabridged contents of the discovered file are attached at the bottom. The identity of the file's original author has been determined authentic, as has his disappearance. Therefore, there is a strong reason to consider this account to be genuine." End quote. So that was a pretty weird note that got found, can't lie. But this note describes a level that isn't accessible by normal means. Now, this level has to be accessed by an entity banishing you to it. And I'll get more into that later. The level has been given a class undetermined because of the weird properties and how very few people have actually gotten here. But help is the name of it because that was the file name of that note in the database. And therefore, this level has been given that name. It's thought that this level functions as a type of prison for things that have been banished by that entity. 
based on the file's description, it takes the appearance of a large pocket dimension that's very dark and gloomy. Most of it is a very dull and empty void populated with sporadic energy and lightning storms. The ground is just hard gray material, the sky is gray and black, and it expands out. At an unknown point in this stormy void, a random building exists, and this building is a prison, because it's made of prison cells. The cells have stone walls and iron bars, and they do not obey physics or geometry or pretty much anything at all, because inside of the cells is much bigger than it looks on the outside. And like I said, this level is a prison dimension, like a prison colony kind of, and the only way to enter is by being banished from an entity. You have to make a certain entity mad and it sends you here. We have a guess on what the entity is and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. And if it is that entity, we know why it's so powerful. Just know you should not make it mad. But this is just a large void with storms and lightning and a decaying remote prison. It's, it's pretty cool to me, I, I think it's pretty neat. So now I'm gonna read that entire note and I'm gonna show you the important parts because it's really long, but I'll show you the parts that we've gotten and I'll show you also what entity we think controls this place. I am Jacob Howard of Team Michael in the Meg's Quick Match Regiment. I am currently stranded in an environment which to my knowledge has not been documented in the database. Screw it, this is taking too long to form my words. I just gotta type. I barely have enough Wi-Fi signal and battery life to upload this file to the database as it is. For anyone reading this, I am sorry in advance for the lack of formality, but I'm worried about more important things at the moment. I don't know where I am, but I know how I got here. I was making the rounds in level 1 searching for lost wanderers in need of rescue. Came across this entity, a shadowy guy in a cloak with a large ring of keys. I saw him approaching a wanderer and I rightfully assumed the worst, so I drew my weapon. Suddenly he came out of nowhere with this golden key that he pulled off his ring. He literally ripped a hole in the air with it, I can't explain it better. He just opened a hole in the air and he shoved me into it and now I'm here. I'm in some kind of holding cell where I'm definitively being held prisoner for all intents and purposes. No idea why I'm not dead, but not that I'm complaining. The cell looks like the kind in a medieval dungeon. Heavy wrought iron bar door, surrounded by stone on all sides. Its dimensions are perfectly fitted to the size of my body, with there being exactly enough room to stand up and reach out my arms completely. My god, there's no bottom or ceiling or walls here, I'm just floating in this endless void. The cages aren't even being held by anything, we're just in this massive empty void. Everything's suspended in midair. He's here. The cloak guy. He popped himself out of nowhere. I have to finish this quickly. I have no clue how to get out of here. I'm assuming those keys on his ring could. I don't have much time, Meg. If you're reading this, you better come and rescue me ASAP. If this is the last time anyone hears from me, I just want to say that I thought I did what was right. And this is how I'll go out if it comes to that. So the file then ends right after he says that, and that's pretty much all we know. This Jacob guy has not been found or located whatsoever, but we do have a sneaking suspicion that the entity is Entity X, the Keymaster. This is a very powerful creature, one of the most strong in the back rooms and can kind of just control time and reality. I'll link a video that I made on him in the description. Who knows though, weird prison level. You shouldn't make the Keymaster mad. You shouldn't do any of that, but don't go here. Unless you're me, I could probably survive myself, but hope you enjoyed. So level 228 doesn't actually have a classification graphic, which I find pretty interesting. But if I personally were to give it one, I would give it a class undetermined because of its unknown effects and its unknown features. And there's a lot of them, let me tell you. The level itself takes the appearance of a sprawling mirror maze with very strange lighting on all sides. The lighting behind the mirrors and around the mirrors can take any color possible. And the mirror maze sort of looks like one of those you find at a carnival or a fair. The maze itself is actually not that hard to escape on the surface. It just might take a few days to get to the end of it, just simply because of the size of the level. The issue is, the level's effects might just make that a lot harder than it seems. Trust me, it does make it a lot harder than it seems. And you'll see what I'm referring to later on the video. Now, under the first paragraph of the level's documentation, there's a sentence that says, quote, The level's also pretty stable, so it's a good place to rest for a bit, too. Quiet, too. Just don't go too deep until you're ready for it. 
end quote. So from that sentence, we get the fact that the level is actually pretty calm and pretty quiet with no entities running at you. Well, kinda. But that last part of the sentence, that last part where it says, don't go too deep. Gee, I wonder what dangers could that imply? So if you do end up going too deep into the mirror maze too fast, some interesting things will begin to unfold before your eyes. Your reflection will start to change ever so slightly in the mirrors. It'll be really small things at first, like the logo on your shirt will change, the color of your pants will change, the shoelaces that you're wearing will change, and small things like that will begin to look different in your own reflection inside of the mirrors in the maze. Now, if you've ever been in a mirror maze in real life, you know that there's like an infinite amount of reflections of you. So every single move you make, even just the shake of a finger, the mirrors will start to reflect that action over and over and over again with a slight delay each time. The further away the reflection, the slower the mirror will react. So when you're at that point in this level, the mirrors will begin to change those slight things about you. Even deeper on into the maze, the mirrors will begin to warp your reflection even more. Your face will begin to distort into weird shapes, and your hair will start to look longer or shorter and your body will start to show more limbs in each reflection, more fingers, more toes, and eventually you'll start to become more unrecognizable. Then there's a quote after that paragraph that says, quote, but they're all you. You'll know if you look into their eyes, you'll see the same thoughts, the same hopes, the same pain, end quote. So essentially this mirror maze begins to warp your reflection into something that is beginning to look inhuman. It's looking less and less like you every second you're stuck here. You'll still be able to see that it's you if you look up into the eyes of the reflection, but it's still uncanny. Now at this point in the maze, what is real and what is a reflection will start to blur together. The lines between reality and reflection become even thinner, and every single twitch you make gets echoed a million times over and over again, to the point where you don't even know if you are the reflection and the thing in the reflection is you, or if the other thing's real and you're fake. It's hard to tell. Even further on, the reflections might show you as a wretch or another entity or even another person that doesn't even look like you. These reflections will begin to have a slight delay in the moves that you make, giving you this uncanny, creepy feeling. As of writing this video, it's unknown if these things in the reflections are actually you or if there's a real entity or another human type thing behind the mirrors, just like imitating whatever you're doing. Whatever the case may be, this is where the mental effects of the level really start to take a hold of you. Even deeper into the maze, some of the mirrors will not even show a reflection. No matter how long you stare at it, no matter what you do in front of it, there is no reflection at all. This is said to be extremely bad for wanderers' minds due to the derealization that it might give. You know, every mirror you've looked into in real life, you've seen yourself. And the fact that you're literally looking into a mirror and nothing is reflecting back, it'll just make you feel not real. Now, if you somehow make it through all of what I just talked about, all of that, you'll make it to the deepest part of the level. It's not quite the middle part, because the middle is where the exit is, but this is the deepest part that can be explored. This part is very distorted and confusing for anyone that comes here, because at this point, the mirrors here will begin to change into windows, and you can look into these windows, and you'll see other windows and mirrors and TV screens and puddles, and literally any object that has a reflection, you'll be able to see it through these mirror window things. So it pretty much just opens up this huge, infinite area that can be looked into. All of these reflections will be showing your face, and your face will be looking back at you. From every single angle, you'll be looking at yourself, to the point where the level begins to make you think you're the reflection, and your actual body isn't even real. Now, if you don't let yourself go crazy, and you somehow make it through all that and keep going, you'll begin to enter the center of the level. Now, a letter from the author about the center of the level reads as follows. When I looked into this mirror, I saw nothing but myself, everything about myself, my flaws, my hopes, my fears, my shames, my secrets, my successes, my failures, all of it reflected back at me in an impartial reflection. We tell ourselves a lot of lies, and this mirror stripped me of mine. It laid me bare with nowhere to hide. I don't know how long I was there, teetering on the edge between human and wretch finally coming to terms with the despair in my heart. If you're ready and you want to understand, 
look into the mirror. I'll be waiting. Find me. End quote. So that's just not horrifyingly derealization uh, crisis at all, right? That's just completely normal. So try not to look into the reflections in this level at all, especially once you get deeper. You know, maybe at the beginning, the level's, you know, a calm mirror maze. You might be able to look at it there. But once you get deeper and these weird warped figures begin looking back at you and you can't even tell what's real and what's you from what's in the mirrors, don't even look at yourself. Just look straight at the ground and follow the path. To enter the level, it doesn't say. So that actually might be a good thing because now you don't know how to get yourself trapped here, but it also could be a bad thing because you might accidentally come here and you don't know what to avoid. But if you do get sent here and you want to escape, the only way you can escape is you can find a random placed door among these mirrors. And the door itself will be labeled 149. You have to then open that door and you'll be on the actual level 149. It's, it's that simple. Now, speaking of 149, it's actually a completely safe paradise, actually. It's, it's completely normal. There's no dangers here. So maybe it's actually worth it to try to come to this mirror maze. That way you can get to the paradise of level 149. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments. The level's page starts with a medical report of someone who was found not alive, which is, of course, a great way to start off a level. It reads as follows. Date, January 6, 2016. Dear Jenny Blackwood, it is with a heavy heart and profound responsibility that I write to you concerning the tragic incident involving Michael Richardson. Incident Overview. The date of the incident, January 2, 2016. Location, near Elmwood Park, Oak Street. Time, approximately 11.30 p.m. Medical Findings. Upon arrival at the scene, Michael Richardson was found in a critical state due to a vehicular collision. Despite immediate intervention and emergency care, the extent of the injuries was severe. The primary cause of death was identified as traumatic brain injury, compounded by multiple internal injuries. Efforts to resuscitate were exhaustive, but regrettably unsuccessful. Time of death. Michael Richardson was pronounced deceased at 12.15 a.m. Please accept my deepest condolences for your loss and know that my thoughts are with you during this challenging time. Sincerely, Dr. Elizabeth, Chief of Emergency Medicine, Elmwood Hospital. Someone is no longer alive and you'll definitely see what happened later on the video. Backrooms level 251 has been classified as a class two survival difficulty because it's very unsafe and it's very insecure and it has a low but very, very dangerous entity count. The physical description of the level has been cataloged as the following. Level 251 consists of several branching segments of watercourse tunnels, just like those tunnel rides that you'd get on at Disney or in like a theme park. That's what it looks like here. Inside these tunnels, there are two narrow walkways on each side. In the grand scheme of the back rooms, level 251 is actually pretty small and is estimated to only be about 20,000 kilometers squared. The different tunnels in this level typically stretch out into a mile in length, and at the end of that mile, they split off into two other directions. The level has no natural lighting, since it takes place inside of tunnels, and the only source of light is very dim lamps that are scattered across the walls. The lamps suck, for lack of a better term, and they barely put out any light, so if you want to see where you're going, you probably should bring your own lantern or flashlight or something, because in this level, there are literally parts that are pitch black. So do with that what you will. The different tunnel sections are segmented by a decorative archway, and these archways normally take a romantic or lovey theme. For instance, an archway could be a heart, or swans, or flowers, or something else. All of these things are love or romantic themed. The walls of the tunnels here typically are rough and very coarse. They're covered in mold and dust, and it's actually to the point where you can just see mole spores and dust floating in the air. Underneath the tunnel's tracks and the paths, there is a ditch-like structure where knee-deep water flows constantly. Now the water is gross, it's disgusting and dirty. It's very abandoned looking, and it seems very murky. There's often a bunch of dirt and debris floating in the top of it. While walking through the level, you might come across an abandoned boat or something like that that takes the appearance of a swan. You've seen those swan boats from those real-life love cave ride things. They're here as well. 
Most of these boats look old and abandoned, just like the rest of the level, and it is not recommended to step foot inside unless you just want to sink into the water. The rest of the tunnels are decorated with things that used to look good. There are weird looking dolls and animatronics, and you can tell at one time that wherever this level is used to be a vibrant and colorful romantic place. It used to be very, very cute and charming. The decor you might see could include old heart cutouts, or roses, or cupids, or doves, or other symbols of love, and you also might see little panoramic window scenes with small figurines. These decorations, however, are not present in every single tunnel, and sometimes you might find yourself walking in an empty tunnel with nothing but these moldy waters and walls. Now, these specific empty tunnels are interesting because multiple wanderers have reported experiencing a serene calmness while walking through them. Some have said they get a really deep, nostalgic feeling as well. The reason for this is unknown, but it's in these empty areas where the walls and the water are rougher and more coarse. It's also been noted that wanderers develop an addiction to walking deeper and deeper into these empty tunnels the longer they're inside of them. So because of this, it's not recommended to stay in any tunnel for long, much less the empty ones. Even deeper into the complex of tunnels, wanderers might stumble upon a room that looks to be an entrance of the ride. The room will have a waiting line area with those red velvet ropes, there'll be a ticket booth, and there'll be chairs where you can sit and relax. The sign in this room says the name of the attraction. The name is Love Ride, which is where the name of the level comes from, if you didn't catch that. There's a panel with a red button inside of the booth that can be pressed if you want to start up the ride, and when you press the button, you'll hear a bunch of old machinery noises begin to start, only for a few seconds before it fades into silence. After this, you can get into a boat or a cart, and you can begin your journey through the rest of the level. The level is home to an entity that is extremely unsettling, and to be honest, very dangerous. Actually, it's probably one of the more dangerous ones I've gone over. Hidden at the bottom of the level's page is this image, with the caption, what have I done to deserve this? Why do you make me suffer? I mean, that picture is just nightmare fuel as it is. So let's get into the explanation of it and see how much worse it can get. The entity in question is Entity 215-A, the Apparition, and it's been classified as a Class 3B danger. The Apparition manifests itself as a wanderer's former lover or former partner or just someone from their past romantic life. The entity will physically take the appearance of that former lover, and it'll say things and mention things that you and your former lover used to talk about. The entity has been known to use psychological manipulation to hunt down its targets, and it'll do things like whisper and call out to you in order to lure you deeper towards it. It's been stated that the apparition preys on the wanderer's emotional vulnerability and will break down the psyche of anyone it can. It'll keep doing this mental warfare until the wanderer is completely too tired or incapacitated and can't move. Once this happens, the entity will initiate something called the consumption process. So this is nasty, prepare yourself. The apparition will begin to attach itself to wanderer's skin and it will progressively digest them from the outside in, starting with the skin and working its way into the inside organs. Let me repeat that. This apparition thing will graft itself to your skin and eat you like a spider, kind of. The consumption is over when the entire body is consumed and only a pile of bones and flesh and clothes are left behind. Nice. In order to not become the apparition's next meal, you need to ignore any voices or any signs of someone that you think you know on this level. You need to keep moving in a straight line and do not detour down other tunnels, and you need to stay aware of reality. Do not let yourself fall back into the memories of that apparition. No matter how much you love that person, they are not here, they are not real. Failure to do those things that I just said will cause you to become a pile of bones and clothes and be the next meal from the apparition. To enter the level, you can find a tunnel in the pool rooms that leads to one of these tunnels here, and to exit, you need to find a randomly placed exit door in the side of the tunnel to get out. These are usually placed in completely random spots, so good luck finding that. To recap this level, it is a semi-large complex of tunnels that looks like those old romantic boat rides from real life. 
Everything here is abandoned, all the hearts, the doves, the cupids, the boats, the tunnels, it's all old and rotten, and all the water smells gross, it's dusty and moldy. Inside these tunnels lives the apparition entity, which tries to lure you towards itself by acting like a former romantic partner of yours. Once it does that, well, it'll eat you. That's, <laughs> frankly, it's going to consume you. And that's pretty much it for the level. Backrooms level 890, or overprotection as it's been nicknamed, is classified as a class pending survival difficulty because it's unsafe and unsecure to be frank. There is a low entity count, but it doesn't matter because the entity that is here is, is just very dangerous. Again, I'll get into that later. Hold tight. Level 890 is the 891st level in the catalogs of lore, and it takes the following appearance. The level resembles a foggy, empty, and abandoned amusement park with signage that calls itself Happy World. As if that's not creepy enough, it gets worse. The park is brightly and vibrantly decorated, and it has booths and rides and buildings and games and all sorts of the other stuff that you would see at a theme park from real life. The air smells sugary, and you can smell food cooking, and there's just this cheerful vibrance to the surroundings. The entire theme park will pretty much remind you of a local county fair from your childhood, or like a state fair or something, and oftentimes it looks like that too, with the ferris wheels and the, you know, the party games and everything like that. Sometimes it looks a little too much like the things from your childhood and the fairs from your childhood, and it seems that the level somehow warps it to look like that specifically for you and anyone else who comes here, so watch out for that. The vast majority of the level is unexplored due to, honestly, how hard it is to even get here. But the environment itself poses pretty much no danger to wanderers that are exploring here, except the obvious dangers of, like, falling off a ride or falling and, like, breaking an ankle or something. Other than that, it's only your fault that you can get injured. The real dangers will come later, I promise. The park seems to be fully maintained and taken care of, and most things here are very clean and they're very orderly. But the problem is, no workers or any other things are ever seen walking around here. It's almost like the level cleans itself. Sometimes the Ferris wheel and the other rides will literally start and operate themselves as well. The air I mentioned smells very sweet, like funnel cakes or fried Oreos, and these smells are emitting from the food stands and trucks that are scattered throughout the park. These trucks are typically in these food court type areas where there's a bunch of vendors and stores and shops and souvenir stores, and all of them have like merchandise and hats and stuff for the Happy World amusement park. The Happy World logos and designs are very uncanny looking, and you'll get strange, unnerving feelings while looking at them. You know it's not real, but it looks so real. It looks like somebody did this on purpose, but there's no one else around. Now, the bad news about that good smelling food is that it's usually spoiled or rotten, so you can't eat anything. But the souvenir shops do typically have small supplies and sometimes even drinks or, you know, refreshments in the refrigerators inside. It's highly recommended to drink almond water while you're exploring this carnival. That way you don't get overwhelmed with the feelings of uneasiness or loneliness or anything like that. It's a very common thing to get those feelings. Just don't worry about it, okay? Level 890 has absolutely no day or night cycle, and it's stuck in a constant daytime. And the temperature here stays from a 53 degrees Fahrenheit to like 68 degrees, which is 12 Celsius to 20 Celsius. For anyone here that's not from the US of A, which means it's a very cool and crisp level to be on. The level is prone to random events of thick fog rolling in that covers up the sun and the sky. This fog is a moniker of bad things to come, and it gives the entire place a very unsettling energy. The fog will also make it hard to explore the level, since, well, you can't see through fog, but besides that, the level is normally safe until the fog happens. It seems as if whatever or whoever controls the level uses this calm and vibrant theme park as a sort of distraction, and then once the fog comes in, the facade falls and crumbles. Let me explain. It's thought, due to a few logs being found, and a few writings, and a few notes, and just word of mouth, that a single entity rules over this level and controls it. The entity is only known as Restatic. The creature seems to be perpetually covered up in fog, and it is extremely malevolent and insidious. It seems to be able to control the fog and use it in a way to like hunt and capture its prey, which is, which is you in this case. The following notes and description is all we have of the entity. 
It takes the very vague appearance of a humanoid shape. It can block out the sun with fog when it's close, and it also has this like splash damage effect where structures and items nearby will start to decay into black dust and soot when it walks closer. Lastly, it seems to be able to animate regular objects into entities and creatures. The creature is so powerful and it seems to have full grasp and control over the life here. If you've ever seen like the Avengers movies, it's like Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet. It can pretty much do anything here. The entity is known to attack wanderers on sight, and it'll do so quickly and without remorse. Allegedly, people have reported structures changing into giant snakes, or scary animatronics, or human parts just dragging themselves along, but pretty much the entity can transform the entire reality to look however it wants to, and it pretty much will realize your biggest fear while it's attacking you. It's a very dark force, a macabre energy, black as the night. If you look at the entity, it almost looks to be a wormhole or a pitch vanta black, and you just get this sinking feeling in your gut by seeing it off in the misty fog. Safe to say, just don't look at it. You'll know the creature is coming because of that fog, like I said, and if you do see the fog, you need to run and you need to hide, because if you doubt the entity, it will find you. There are several places of interest inside of the Happy World Amusement Park that I'm about to go over. There are the vibrant gardens, the black tent rooms, the rides, and the parking lots, as well as a river area. And most of these are self-explainable, but since I'm here to explain the self-explainable, I'm gonna go over them. The gardens here are filled with strange, colorful flowers and large humanoid statues. The statues are known to be like animatronics in a way, and they're fully movable. They seem to have free locomotion. They're very creepy to stare at, and they give off uncanny valley energy, but they're not known to be dangerous. The black tent rooms are a collection of tents with black fabric, and you can enter these tents, and once you do your inside, you'll notice that there's a ton of infinite paths that you can take to walk from tent to tent. It's kind of like the labyrinth of level zero, but inside of tents. The restatic entity that controls the level seems to be drawn to these tents, but other than this, not much is known about them. The working rides in this level are just rides. That's it. There's roller coasters, Ferris wheels, all that kind of stuff, but you should never get on a ride, because if you do, you might be teleported directly to the restatic entity. The parking lots here are filled with old, rusty, and corroded cars, and a lot of these cars are uncanny and liminal. It seems like it's a snapshot out of the 80s. And lastly, the river is the rarest part of the level. It's located in a small greenery section of the park, and the river is a cool and liminal area where you can swim in the water, and it's normally known as the safest part of the level because the restatic entity typically doesn't venture this way. To enter the level, you have to find a colorful wall in level 122, and no clip through it of course, and to exit, you need to go into a random souvenir shop near the food trucks, and you need to find a door, labeled exit, of course. If you go through that door, then you'll wake up on level 448. But in order to get to the exit, you're going to need to evade the restatic entity and all its strange power chasing you down. If you think you can do that, be my guest and try, but I'm going to be honest, I doubt you can. This level really preys on childhood innocence, because its description and its environment is so calm and full of joy, but then you realize something sinister controls the entire place, and it uses that calmness as a trap. The entire level is like a mouse trap in a way, and the cheese that's used to set the trap is the cool and, you know, vibrant area that you recognize from your childhood. But when you stick your head in too close, the restatic entity will slam down on top of you, and, well, <laughs> it'll, it'll consume you. That's all I'm gonna say. Just like that, the video is over. You just spent the last 50 minutes listening to me ramble on about the back rooms, and I hope that you sincerely enjoyed it. I know I enjoyed making this video, and I know you all love these long form content style of videos. If you do want more and you did watch to the end for some reason, please leave a like and tell me in the comments which compilations you'd like to see me do, any specific ones in mind or whatever. I don't really have much to say in the outro, I just I hope you have a great day, I hope you have a great night, wherever you are. Life is good. Remember to smile and tell somebody you love them. Without further ado, I'm going to end off the video here, and I'll see you all in the next video.